Welcome to the Yoga Therapy Hour with our guest, Arun Deva. Arun takes us on a whirlwind today, and I personally love this conversation. He starts off giving us an overview of what is yogic psychology, and then comparing and contrasting that to Ayurvedic psychology. And the bottom line is that Ayurvedic psychology is maybe, in his opinion, a little bit more passive. It's kind of like step one, allowing you to heal the body and the mind. And that step two is yogic psychology, where you have to take responsibility, you have to do the work, and it's very much self-empowered. So the reason we have both, which of course, both of them come from the same roots, but there's something for everyone, someone who maybe wants a little bit more passive approach with herbs and Abhyanga oil massages and medicines, that's for everyone. And that not very many people actually want to walk the true yogic path with the end game being detachment from this human body and knowing that you are the light, you are Purusha. Like that, that end game is hard for a lot of us. It requires so much detachment and discernment and letting go and surrendering and being of service. It's actually yogic psychology shows us that yoga is not an easy path. We go into the thought that for most people who call themselves yogis these days, it's a very heavy emphasis on the postures and maybe a little bit of breathing. And that there's been a lot of critique about that in the yoga world, that we're just kind of cherry picking one little piece out of the entire yoga sutra and focusing on that. But according to Arun, that's where we are individually and collectively, that our minds are actually not ready for the higher levels of yoga that you see in chapters three and chapters four. And in fact, we shouldn't ask people to be doing that when they're not prepared. So it's just a fascinating conversation. The other thing I love about Arun is how he ties our individual health into our collective health, into the health of mother nature. And he goes into an area that may be uncomfortable for some people talking about grasping or a parigraha this idea that I need more and more and more to feel safe, to feel secure, to pass on to future generations. And that that accumulation of wealth without passing it through and being of service actually can make us sick. And so it's a very interesting tangent that we go into that caring for each other, being of service, taking care of mother earth is actually going to benefit us individually and our own health, because that's why we're here. We're householders, and we're here to be of service to each other and to the world. I hope you enjoy this interview, and we love to receive feedback. You're always welcome to let us know on our Facebook page. The Facebook page is called the Yoga Therapy Hour with Amy Wheeler, and that's a place where we can have discussions if you'd like to join in. Welcome to the Yoga Therapy Hour. My name is Amy Wheeler and I'm your host. The Yoga Therapy Hour is here to support you on your mental, emotional, and spiritual journey. We talk about things like nervous system regulation, spiritual connection, how to be more involved in your community, how to communicate well, how to manage your mental health. There are so many things that we are excited to share with you in season five of the Yoga Therapy Hour podcast. And we hope that you will share it with your friends, family, colleagues. All right, let's get into today's episode. Hello, and welcome to the podcast today, where I have my friend and colleague, Arun Deva. Welcome, Arun. Thank you. Arun, you and I have this love of, I don't know, yogic psychology, if you will. And so I think I'd like to just start and have you define what that means to you. Well, let's be clear. Are we talking about yogic psychology or Ayurvedic psychology, or are we umbrellaing it to include both? 
well, you can take it wherever you want to go. If you want to talk about yoga and then Ayurveda and the similarities, or you can just choose one, I'm open. Okay. Well, I like that. So why don't we start with yogic psychology? So for yogic psychology, obviously we're going to look at the yoga sutras, right? Yes. And so if we look at the yoga sutras, and I think I actually said this once in a workshop that if any psychologist ever wants to study psychology, all they have to do is go to the yoga sutras. <laughs> it's all right there for you. You just need a teacher to take you through it because it's in an archaic language. If we go that way, it needs to be unpacked. It's a zip drive. It needs to be unpacked. Mm. So the yoga sutras, if we look at them, we've got four mm. chapters. So the first chapter is basically giving you how to get to the end game. So it's going to start with if you're ready to go all the way, this is all you need. But if you're not ready to go all the way, if you need to be convinced and you need to start with baby steps, then you jump into the second chapter. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then as a result of the second chapter, you start to find out a little bit about your powers, about you know what you're actually capable of when you step into your truth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so then you move into the third chapter. And then guess what? You have to bounce right back into the first chapter to access the fourth chapter. So it's interesting that it's done that way. But one of my teachers explained it this way. They're like, if somebody is coming to this who is ready to jump in, why should they even bother with the preliminaries and the baby steps? So it's best to just start there. And those who are ready for it, they can just jump in there and they're good to go. And then they can read the second chapter and help others and third chapter to verify and as a warning for the powers that they picked up and eventually slide into the fourth chapter, which is where you actually achieve the highest goal of any psychological theory as far as the Vedic cultures are concerned, which is to step in fully into who you really are. It's so interesting. I remember maybe 10 years ago, we had a training and we got to the fourth chapter and we're talking about it. And some of the students were like, what are you talking about? I don't want this kind of detachment. I don't want this kind of neutrality. That sounds boring. That sounds like there's no passion. There's no fun left in life. And I said, well, I think by the time we get there, we might actually prefer that. We might prefer just being in stillness in a very, very sattvic way. But have you ever had students say that when they figure out where the end game is? Yeah. So not so much for one major reason. And that is I never teach the fourth chapter. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Look at you. I need to learn from this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and even actually the third chapter only goes so far. Mm. Uh, and even the first chapter, I only go so far because the truth is in our world today, nobody's really ready for even the first chapter. We're just focused on the first chapter. And if we want to be very honest, we're not even focused on the first chapter. We're so focused on sutras where he goes into asana. <laughs> yeah. I don't remember the exact number, but we're at a starting point where, man, yeah. we're just... 246, 247, 246, exactly. <laughs> so is, that, <laughs> is that reasonable though? Should we, since that's where our society and our psyches mainly are, is that okay that yogic psychology becomes get on your mat, move, breathe, focus, try to feel good in your body? Is that enough? Is that okay? Okay, so that's actually a wonderful question to ask because we can validate that it is okay by the very fact that our modern field of psychology moved from psychiatry, which is let's just apply medicine to psychology, where let's listen to what the person has to say. Because, I mean, if you look back at psychology in the 50s, there was a couch you laid down on, and mm -hmm. there was a guy sitting on a couch. And you poured your heart out and you felt better and you walked away. And I'm like, wait, this is a confessional. <laughs> That's all it is. We've just updated the confessional, medicalized it, if you wish. You know, I love that. It's medicalized Catholicism. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and I wouldn't even you know, call it Catholicism, although that is accurate. But it belongs to every religion. You go to a priest. And yeah. you confessed, you know, there isn't a single religion where you don't do that. And then they go, OK, you know, you're OK, you're fine. You you poured out your heart. So we progress from that to psychotherapy, which is where the where the guy sitting on the couch actually gets into conversation with you. 
Mm-hmm. You know, you're on the couch and the person is on chair. And then eventually they move you onto a chair too. So then you're actually talking to each other and you're having a conversation. And now we've got psychosomatic therapy, mm. which is where you're not only talking to each other, but you're also encouraging each other to use your body to heal your mind. So from that perspective, you know, if that's where we really are today, and that is actually working better than anything else has worked before, psychosomatics, then hell yeah. I mean, we should be using asana to heal our minds. Absolutely. I love that whole connection you made from psychiatry to psychology, to psychotherapy, to psychosomatic therapy. I have a a sensitive question and you don't have to answer this, but You know, I've heard my Indian friends say that traditionally in India, people are not doing talk therapy. They're not doing, you know, going to see a therapist type of thing. Is that because the the family of origin was there to support and care for one another and listen to each other? Or, Or what's your opinion on that? Why has it not been traditional in India? And maybe that's not even true. So correct me if I'm wrong to not seek out mental health care professionally? Well, I mean, look, in the 1940s, 1950s, when we first started talking about psychology, it was tainted. It was, you know, if you went to see a psychologist, there was it was like you've got a stigma on you. Mm-hmm. It, you didn't behind closed doors. You didn't talk about it. It wasn't what it is today. Yeah. So in other words, we got educated. Mm. India is a vast population. It's over a billion people. That's one third of the population of this world. And the majority of them, they're in survival mode. Mm. And they certainly don't have finances to go see a psychotherapist. Mm. But if you go into the bigger cities, you go into Bombay and Delhi and, you know, some of the other bigger cities, psychotherapy is all the rage. (laughs) You know, amongst the wealthy of India, which is a small percentage of India, but it glares in your face because typically when you go to India, you go to the big cities and that's where they are. You Mm. know, I like to say the big cities of India are more Americanized than America. If you go into those big cities, uh, psychotherapy is huge. My niece is in psychotherapy in India. Both of them, actually, two of them. So, but look, uh, there's another aspect to it also. You know, we're extremely sensitive, especially in the West. It's like we open our bodies up to expose our wounds. And our wounds are, of course, you know, they're fresh, so they're very sensitive. We've we've dug into them. We've dug into our past. We're We're doing some very sensitive work, and it's showing. But here we're talking about thick-skinned people, people who are just, you know, just trying to survive, just trying to make enough money to live. And, you know, they don't have the luxury of being thin-skinned as we have. Mm -hmm. So for them, sitting and doing prayer and learning from your elders, and, and I say that's the best place to go for psychotherapy anyway. Yeah. You know, it's so funny you should say this, because when when I used to go to India, we'd have a group that got together from all over the world, just countries, everybody come together. And it would be a month long called the melting pot. And it was rough. We spoke all different languages. We had different cultures, different values, different beliefs. And, and part of the training was to go in and get a little more thick skinned to see your reactions and to be generous with the others when they had these reactions. And we all knew that was part of it, that it's not about delving into your sensitivities and can you heal this wound and that wound? It's like, yeah, you guys need to get a little tougher. And they used to say to us, you in the West are so sensitive. And they even told us that we lacked confidence because of our sensitivities, that we had gone too far in one direction and that we needed to kind of toughen up and have confidence even in really difficult situations. Would you agree with that? I mean, this was 20 years ago, but what do you think? Is that a method of teaching from India or maybe just for us? <laughs> well, I mean, look, when you open a wound, right? And that's what we're very good at doing here in America. We're very good at opening wounds. We're going to be sensitive. So what does it mean to thicken the skin again? Does it mean that we just scar up again? Is that what it means? Do we just scar ourselves again? No. I think we've come here for a reason. I think we've come here to the sensitivity for a reason. So we can dig into the deeper, you know, the psychic wounds, 
you know, mm. not just our physical wounds, but our psychic wounds. And so, yes, we're allowing ourselves to be more vulnerable. And if we slip back into a thicker skin, it's not going to be authentic. Mm. And it's not going to be the true surrender. It'll be the wrong surrender. It'll be like, I give up, which is the wrong surrender. You know, we don't give up, we accept. And so I think it's very important that we learn to accept. If we want to move forward, yes, there is one thing that we can learn. If we want to move forward, we have to accept our wounds and to accept other wounds. And I think, Amy, this is very important for people to understand. We have to recognize that we are wounded and not that we are sick. Mm not that we are ill, not that we are diseased. We do not have to medicalize our psychology. We are wounded. And there's a whole different therapy for wounding. It's called healing. Mm -hmm. And there may be some people who need medication to be able to even do that work, but we don't just automatically put everyone on medication to avoid doing that work. Yes, because the wound turns into a disease. We all know that. Yeah. And so, yes, so when the wound is turned into a disease, of course you have to apply the medication. But if you don't do both parts, if you don't do both things, look, the Yoga Sutras that you and I just love so much, if you're stuck in the second chapter, you've missed the whole point. <laughs> you know, the second chapter is where you're dealing with the vyati, you're dealing with the disease. But once you get past the act, you got to go to the wound, which is the wound is not knowing who you are. Yeah. And that's the first chapter. You know, you go back to the wound, you go back to who am I? But yes, right now I'm in pain. So I am the personality. You have to work with that first. We have to work with the ego. And with the ego, sometimes we have to pull out the medicine. Mm. Well, speaking of medicine, let's go all the way back to my first question. Tell me, how is Ayurvedic psychology different from this beautiful description you've given of yogic psychology from the perspective of Patanjali's Yoga Sutra? What is Ayurvedic psychology? How is that different? It's not so much that it's different. It's for everyone who doesn't want to go past the second chapter. The second chapter today needs to be done through the lens of Ayurveda. And I say this over and over and over again. It needs to be done through the lens of Ayurveda because Ayurveda is for everybody. Mm. But the end goal of Ayurveda is Neschitta. It is exactly the same as yoga. The end goal. It has to be because both of them are faced in the philosophy called Sankhya. Mm-hmm. You know, Sankhya means get to know yourself. How do I get to know myself? Enumerate yourself. Whoa, really? That's how I get to know myself? I break myself into parts and see which one of those is me. And we go through 24 parts and we find out none of them are we. And then we're left with just one part. That's the 25th. And all of a sudden, oh, that's who I am? So the end goal is exactly the same. There's no difference. But Ayurveda is it's for the nobility, it's for the Brahman, it's for the Vashya, the, the merchant class, it's for the poor man, it's for everybody, it's for anybody who's not willing to do what you talked about earlier, go to the fourth chapter. Mm-hmm. And is that because it's a more passive approach? You can take your herbs and you can get an Abhyanga oil massage and eat proper foods. I mean, why do you say it's for everyone and you're making it sound a little easier? <laughs> Well, you know, in the Ayurvedic world, we have a saying, and let's not take it arrogantly and let's not take it egoistically, but let's take it realistically. First Ayurveda, then yoga. Mm. Okay. First, heal your body, heal your mind. Get to the place where you're ready for yoga, which is to step away from the hooks that are in your skin and are reeling you away from knowing who you are. The sense Mm -hmm. organs, you know, the motor organs. I want to do this. I want to feel this. Well, who is this I? It's this I is changing. It's constantly changing. It's a construct, what we call the ego. It's a construct. So as long as that's who the I is, you're not going to achieve yoga. But Ayurveda comes along and says, well, let's make this ego as healthy as possible. When the ego is healthy, it's satisfied. And that's where even Tantra comes in. You know, Tantra says there are seven specific steps before you get to know who you really are. And you have to go through them and you have to get past survival, which is the main instinct and the main work of the ego. Mm. 
That's right. You know, it's just survival. Ego is identity. I need this organism to survive. So obviously we're going to start with the ego. So Ayurveda has this great compassion, this great karuna, if you wish. Let's begin with pacifying our ego. Let's begin with medicine. You know, where is the disease? Let's approach it. Where's the wound that caused the disease? Let's approach it. Once we've gotten past that and, and you feel whole and your ego is healthy, the ego wants nothing more than to be happy. Once it realizes that happiness comes from knowing who you are, then the ego is going to merge into the self from whence it came. The, the self whence with a capital came. S. Yes, yes. You know, Arun, I think this is such a critical point that all of us studying yoga and Ayurveda, that there's kramas or titrations, if you will, in the Western medical way to say it, that first you connect with the body, you heal with the body, you work with the body and mind, and then you eventually delink or detach and have more vairagyam. And I see so many people trying to start off on the higher levels of the krama, the yogic psychology, and it isn't appropriate. They have not even learned to live in this body and care for this body. And they're already trying to detach from this body. Well, what does Patanjali say about that? The first impediment towards achieving any of this is vyadi. Yeah. So if you have a body that's not healthy, forget it. Yes, yeah. once you reach a certain stage, if you start to lose your health, that's okay because you've gone to another place. You've gone higher than where the body can distract you. Right. But when you start this journey, there's no way the body cannot distract you. So it's stupid not to make the body less of a distraction. How do you do that? You heal it. And what do you say? I mean, vyadhi is to... Well, the know. second is tanya. So think about that. Immediately goes back to the mind. Because the body in Vedic philosophy, and of course, it's accepted in Jainism and Buddhism and all the others that are nastika that don't accept, the body is a creation of the mind. So wherever is the body, there is the mind. So why is that this distinction? There right. is no such distinction. Tell me one part of your body where the mind is not. So this is a big mistake we make in the West. We connect the mind to the brain. No, that's incorrect. The brain is just an organ. It's just a computer. That's how I see the brain. I just see it as a computer. That's all it is. It's a functional organ. That's all. If I want to connect to the mind, if I'm going to look for an organ to connect to for the mind, I'm going to rather look at the heart. Mm. I'm going to look at emotions, and that's coming from the heart. They're only processed in the amygdala. You know, they're not born in the amygdala. Would you say, I heard someone say this long ago, and it really made a lot of sense to me, that basically a householder's way to reach enlightenment is that their mind or their brain capacity, I know those two things are different, but their thinking mind has dropped down into their heart. And now they're seeing the world through not just the thinking mind, but the thinking mind and the emotions are seeing the same thing. What do you think of that? Well, okay, so let's talk about householders, and that's us, you know, that's all of us. None of us are yogis, <laughs> because the first criteria for being a yogi is to give up society and go into a little hut, and where yoga is contemplation and entering this trance-like state called samadhi. All of us being householders, what is the pathway of a householder to move towards higher states? All texts, all religions, are 100% clear about this. Not one of them disagrees. And that is service. You serve. You serve others. And politically, we're at a crossroads where we're trying to disengage from this reality that society requires service. Yeah. And so we're at a fulcrum, really, where we're being asked to choose between us and me. Mm. And when we lose that us, no man is an island. We're going to be stranded. Yeah. When we're going to be stranded, we might strike out. We can see that in our society today. We are desperately striking out because our system, our way of living, has brought us to this place where we believe the I is more important than the us. Yeah. Rugged individualism. And so are you saying that as long as we're in the householder phase of life, the, the goal is service, does that mean we can't really do jnana yoga or those deep, deep states of meditation and hours and hours of seeking truth? Is that only for after 
we retire and start to withdraw? Or can we do a little of that while we are householders? I don't know, Amy. Tell me, can we? <laughs> I live in a cabin in the woods <laughs> without without a social life. <laughs> Look, if we can do meditation in all this noise, we're gifted. But meditation isn't measured as a success. Meditation is recognizing our capability to detach, not for the sake of detachment, but for the sake of service, so that I may be a better person. As we become better people, we automatically want to serve. Look what happens to us once we're no longer caught in survival. The moment we're not caught in survival, we want pleasure. Yeah. And the moment we we're getting enough pleasure, we want more. We always want more. So then we want power. Yeah. You know, so then we start grasping for power. But it's when we go past these three that we start thinking about, oh, well, how can I serve? That's when we become human. What we share in common with all other animals, which is survival, power, and pleasure. Mm -hmm. We move past that. We actually move into humanity, yeah. humaneness what it means to be human. It's not a biological, you know, heading that we're using it as. Biologically, we're failures as humans. Mm. We're complete failures. Unfortunately, we are a cancer. Oof. Look what we're doing to our planet. Look what we're doing to our host. And our own bodies and minds. Well, of course. If the host is sick, how do you expect to be healthy? You what? always speak truth to Arun. I love that about you. Well, I mean, the main reason we're all unhealthy, we've never been more unhealthy than ever, is we have an unhealthy world and we have an unhealthy medical system. Mm. Which kind of brings us back to the point of today that good health begins in the mind through yogic psychology and or Ayurvedic psychology. And the physical manifests from that. Would you agree with that? The physical health is manifesting from the subtle seeds that we plant in our minds. Look, if the body is a product of the mind and the mind is unhealthy, how do you expect to have a healthy body? I think it's such a sensitive topic because it almost makes you feel like you caused your cancer or you caused your heart problem. And I don't think that's what we're saying. No. We're, that's not what I'm saying. I should be clear. I'm saying I've got genetics. I've got karma. I've got dharma. I'm doing the best I can. And if I want to go forward and be of service, I need to do my very best to take care of my mind and my body to the best of my ability and then let go of the outcome. Yes, absolutely. Psyche is spirit, right? Mm -hmm. The Greek word psyche means spirit. If my spirit is wounded, let's not waste time in who wounded it. You wounded it. I wounded it. No, that's not going to heal your wound. You know, that's like the story of the Buddha, right? He's going to ask you, look, when you've been shot with an arrow, you're like, well, I want to know who shot me. You're going to die. So give that up. Stop it. Stop asking, am I the reason why I'm sick? I don't want to blame myself. No, just get on with the job of healing. Or blame others. Or blame others. Get on with the job of healing. That's not healing. Blaming is not healing. Blaming is shaming. Blaming will do nothing other than make you lame. Be lame. <laughs> uh, the alternative, how do you see it? I mean, I'll give my perspective too, but what does it look like when you decide to stop blaming yourself or others and to attend to the original wound? Like, how do you see that unfolding? We need to start being kind to each other. Mm. We need to start being compassionate. We need to start being less seeking an external cause for all our problems, mm. or blaming ourselves equally. Both of them are just equally bad. We need to get on with what really needs to be done. What do you really want? Do you want to stay in the same space? Because if you do, then you can play the blame game, sure. But do you want to move on? Do you want to heal? That's the first question we have to ask ourselves. Do I want to heal? Or am I safe in my wound? I mean, Carolyn Miss talked about this. Most of us are safe in our wounds. Most of us identify ourselves through our wounds. So what are we doing? Do we want to live in our wounds or do we want to heal? What do we really want? And the truth is we're capable of incomprehensible suffering, mm. both in accepting it and causing it. And some of us feel like we're not living unless we're suffering. That's shortchanging yourself. It's not allowing yourself to grow up. We stop growing up. 
And psychotherapy is there to help us grow up, to stop being the little child that is wounded and just wants to strike out for having been wounded. I was doing this beautiful meditation this morning. It brings you to a place where you're kind of remembering a wound or a difficult time that you feel in your body. And then it just repeats, like, don't go into the story. Don't go into the story. Don't go into the blame game. Don't, you know, just feel those sensations and be with them, the heaviness, the somatic part of it, the embodied part of it. And then it takes you into feeling somatically lightness and the light. It was really profound and powerful for me to not get involved in the blame and shame game and the stories and just stay with it somatically and move from the tenderness and the vulnerability into the lightness. It was lovely. So I think, is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Well, the Buddhists make it even simpler. They focus on the breath. Mm. (laughs) You know, find something that you can focus on in a detached manner. So if you can't focus on your wounds in a detached manner, start with the breath. And as you do that, you get to a place where the wounds get revealed and you're in a position to actually work with them. Look, Amy, you've been doing this work for so long that of course you're able to access those places. But what about a majority of people who are stepping into this for the first time? You know, if you ask them to go examine their wounds, it's going to scare them. It's everything that they've lived for. It's everything that they believe themselves to be. So I agree with the Buddhists there. Start with something simple, something you can do without judgment, you know, just focus on the breath. It'll bring you to that place. It'll bring you to where does my breath want to go? Where does my breath block? Where is it difficult for my breath to enter? All of these things. And when your mind starts to run away, which it will, it's easier to bring it back to the breath than it is to the wound. Yeah, I agree. And I think what you just said is what makes yoga practice in terms of asana and pranayama so potent. It's the breath does it for us, even if we don't know that it's happening. Yeah. I mean, people say to me, oh, asana is not yoga. I go, it is now. (laughs) In the 20th and 21st century, asana is yoga. So why? Because it's telling us, look, 198 sutras, three to asana. How important can it be? Incredibly important. If you actually understand those three, they are incredibly important. If you cannot start with healing, bringing your body into a state of comfort and strength, if you cannot understand that, how are you going to bring your mind into a state of comfort and strength? Right. Yeah. You look at all our rishis or our sages, in their early years, their bodies are beautiful. It's only once they've gone past the body and gone completely into the mind that they lost their bodies will fall apart because it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. But all of them in the beginning part of their journey, all of them, their bodies are gorgeous. It's such a juxtaposition though, because there's been so much critique in the last 10 years about Western yoga only being asana and only being for fitness and health. And what I hear you saying is maybe that's okay. Maybe that's where we're at. And as long as we don't believe that's the end game. Oh, what I'm really saying, Amy, is that our nature is to critique. (laughs) Whatever happens, we're going to critique it. I am with you. I have been looking (laughs) at this, this need to judge. I've been putting out these posts that can you find discernment without judgment? Because discernment is good. We must discern. We must know who not to put our trust in. We must set boundaries. We must communicate. It's not all rainbows and puppy dogs and unicorns, but can you and can I be discerning without that added layer of us, me, ta, that I, me, mine, I know I'm right, you're wrong kind of feelings. Yeah, I think you just went to the heart of it. I can't be right unless you're wrong. So say more about that. Well, there's something there's something wrong about that, right? When <laughs> touch that for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> why can't we both be right? And why do we have to be right and wrong? Why do we have to have these opposites? Mm. And, and you know, judgment is playing into that. Judgment is this is right, this is wrong. There's a recognition that judgment requires separation. Okay. Judgment requires us to move away from the center. 
Okay, so what's the center? For example, what's the perfect temperature? And anything you move away from is either going to be hotter than the perfect temperature or colder than the perfect temperature, right? So that's judgment. I'm moving away from perfect temperature to either, oh, no, it's better to be cold to, or no, it's better to be hot or heavy or light or any of these things. Our whole world is built on judgment between whether this is heavy or light, right or wrong, pleasant or unpleasant. The center is where none of this matters. So if we're not moving towards the center, we're moving towards one of the two. And if we're moving towards one of the two, we're imbalancing ourselves. And why do we do that, Arun? Because it sounds so simple to hear you say it. But something about the ego, in my opinion, almost feeds on that. The ego feels safer if it's judging and separating. Well, you're not going to like my answer, but we've created a society where we're kept in a state of survival mode. So in survival Mm -hmm. mode, you know, it's with any creature in survival mode, you'll destroy anything else to survive. I agree with that. So asmita or this ego identification comes from wanting to survive. Avidya, yes. Look, avidya, we get to asmita right at the end. And asmita isn't even ego, you know. Ahamkar is ego. Asmita is just the sense of I. So we're talking about something much deeper. I don't really want to go into that. But, you know, what do we start with? We start with avidya. But from avidya, how does avidya manifest? It manifests because of raga. And raga always comes with dvesha. You cannot separate raga from dvesha, right? So who is suffering? Who is not suffering? Who is enjoying and who is suffering? That is asmita. Mm. And then the inability to let that go, that is abhinivesha. Okay? So I cannot let go of my suffering. I identify through my suffering. So as long as I identify through my suffering, I'm going to have a life that is caught between birth, which is suffering, and death, which is suffering, and living, which is suffering. Because living is impermanent. It's constantly changing. There's nothing fixed to it. We have to step out of that mode. We cannot do that when we're in survival mode. We cannot do that when we're in pleasure mode. We cannot do that when we're in power mode. So I say, if you want to do that, if you want to achieve that, if you want to get there, start with service. As I'm hearing you speak, there's such an irony that the people who have enough wealth to not be in survival mode, strangely, many of them are even less interested in this thing that you're describing, which is to not judge and to live in that center place, you know? So it's not like having wealth and safety and security makes it any easier to do this work. No, 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 no. Amy, Amy, please. This is how, <laughs> this is how they keep us stuck in this. This wealth is not giving them any security. Mm, tell me more. Please, as far as I'm concerned, I have great compassion for the super rich. Buddha talked about the greatest disease of all is poverty, right? Well, poverty of what? Yes, our poor people, those living on the streets, they have poverty of wealth. They don't have enough money to eat. We can solve that problem easily. That can be solved easily. We just have to come to our senses. We can solve it. There's enough money to take care of each and every person on this planet. That's not the poverty that the rich have. They have the poverty of spirit. Mm -hmm. They are suffering more than that man living on the street. And that is why they cannot even give you one penny, because their belief is that money will take away their suffering. And they suffer more. And they buy into a medical system where they can be tranquilized. And they buy into a psychological system which strokes the ego. As long as you have this money, you're better than everybody else. You think they're going to let that go? You think they're going to give you one penny they have? No, no, no. We just haven't understood them. And they are us when we get to that position. Right. What's to stop us from becoming them? So the system is flawed. We're allowing them. We're allowing poverty of spirit. We're not only allowing it, we're encouraging it among the super rich to enter that club. You have to be greedy. (laughs) You have to be a miser. You have to be Uncle Scrooge. And the rest of us, not all of us, but some of us are looking at it thinking, oh, I want that safety and security. And I do want to acknowledge that when you're not able to pay your rent and you are homeless and you don't have food on the table like that, that's real too. 
When I go for my walk in the evenings, I sometimes pass this man who's always sitting, sometimes in lotus position. He's homeless. Sometimes I think he's just there as a messenger for me. And for me, he has become a messenger. You're going to find the sacred in honest suffering. These people are suffering honestly. There is a beauty to them. I'm afraid to talk to this man. What if he bursts my bubble and just turns out to be some crazy guy? You know, I see him as a rishi and I pass by him every day with just all I need to do with him is go like this when he says hi. And we have this heart to heart connection. I don't know if I'm imagining it. And if I am, what's wrong with that? Maybe there's something beautiful that this poor man living on the street because he can sit in lotus position is actually a sage. And does not have poverty of spirit. It does not have poverty of spirit. How impoverished are we that we judge the homeless? Mm -hmm. And judging is different than having compassion and kindness. Oh, you cannot judge and have compassion. No. You have to be a judge to do that. You have to be granted that special power. No. You've really explained beautifully a quote by Mother Teresa, who, of course, worked in the streets of Calcutta for so many years in India with the poor and homeless and sick. And she said the same thing. She said, we should feel the most compassion for the wealthy because they're the most disconnected. And this is not a blanket statement about all wealthy people, right? This is a generalization, but I always thought about that. Like, what does she mean by that? And I think you've just described it beautifully. Look, in the Yoga Sutras, a body graha, Holding on to wealth is the cause of suffering. And what is the suffering? It prevents you from knowing who you are. Because letting go of wealth allows you to see your past lives. In other words, you see yourself 10 years ago, 15 years ago, as a child, in the mother's womb, maybe earlier. Maybe all the way back to the beginning. Who knows? But at least start somewhere. So letting go has an exuberance, a pleasure to it that you can feel. Each and every person listening to this podcast can feel it by doing one thing very simple. Take 25, take five, just take five $1 notes, put them in your pocket next time you go for a walk. And the first five homeless people you see, give them a dollar each. These days, a dollar is not going to go anywhere. Give them $2 each. Give them $5 each. Give, just give away some of this wealth that you're clipping. If you're a millionaire, give away (laughs) $100,000. Give away (laughs) $10,000. Give away $100 bills. Give something you're not willing to give. If I'm poor, I'm not willing to give a dollar. But it's the homeless who help the homeless. Right, right. Yeah, because they know that suffering. It's so interesting. You know, I grew up very poor with six children, and I think my dad made $17,000. You know, it was something I resented, something I felt not good enough. For a long, long time, I really did have kind of resentment against people who had more than me. And as I've grown spiritually and mentally and emotionally, I've started to understand what a blessing that was to be able to work for every single thing I wanted and the strength of character that that built and the ability to do your best and let go. Like there's so many things that came from that. And I'm so grateful now. Yeah. Life is, I mean, I know this is corny, but life is nothing but lessons. And, you know, if we're going to talk about Ayurvedic psychology, one of the biggest lessons out there is recognizing karma. Mm -hmm. Say more about that. Yeah, I thought you might want to take that hook. <laughs> it's like a yummy little warm up yeah. hook. I'll eat that one. <laughs> God means to do is refers to myself. So, you know, what I do has repercussions. So when have I not been doing? I am because I did. So I'm born because I did. Yeah, mom and dad, they're definitely very much a part of this whole equation, but they're part of my karma. There's no separation from sahaja and karmaja diseases. Sahaja means genealogical diseases, diseases arising out of genetics, and karmaja are diseases arising out of karma, because there is no English word for karma other than cause and effect. That's Newton's law. Karma is Newton's law in that sense. It's a recognition that if you plant an apple seed, you're not going to get a mango tree. 
<laughs> it's a simple recognition that, you know, you have to move beyond the blame shame game and you have to move into this is where I am. Oh, I have to understand my mother to understand why I'm here. I have to understand my father to understand why I'm here. I have to understand my childhood to understand why I'm here. Yeah, you want to stay with that. You keep unraveling for how many lifetimes. How many lifetimes are you going to work on that? Because that's not where the answer is. You can keep unraveling it and unraveling it. Sure, you can do that. And every time you unravel a layer, you feel a little bit better, but you still come up against something. So if you want to really do the healing, you have to move past that. You have to recognize karma. And karma is heyam dukkama nagatam. It's very simple. Karma is, what am I doing right now? Because that's my future. Now, if you look at it that way, man, you may want to change a few things about yourself. <laughs> right? I think that ties back into this whole idea of judgment and shame and blame, too. Like, essentially, if you've learned the lesson, it doesn't do any good to go there. Just what are we doing now to plant these seeds that are growing for the future based on the wisdom that we gained from our past mistakes? Yeah, you can't rest on your laurels, as the old saying goes. You know, when you solve a problem, you can't bask in it because the next problem is just a second away. And it's going to be a problem that you haven't solved yet. Just because you solved the problem, don't think you've solved them all. <laughs> you have not. <laughs> What's coming up next, you're going to have to get skilled at solving problems rather than skilled in feeling good because you solved the problem. Mm. That's a nicely refined thought. So Arun, when I hear you say this about karma, of course, I have to ask a really hard question. And I know that you have these answers. What do you say about people who were born into poverty or born with disability? Or do you even go there? Because, you know, if our current creates our future and our past created our current, to me, it seems a little bit like victim blaming. Enlighten me. Help me. Yeah, that is a tough question, Amy. I'm not sure I want to answer it. It is a very tough question. It goes to the heart of so many things. It brings out answers that are just going to make us defensive. I can only give one safe answer. If karma brought them to that place, have compassion. And they need to have compassion for themselves. We need to have compassion for them and they need to have compassion for themselves. I don't have any other answer. I mean, yes, I do, but it's just going to open a can of worms and I don't want to go there. We're not ready for that. But yes, we are ready to have compassion for them. Give them a helping hand, have compassion for them, change your karma. Can you change your karma by helping somebody else change their karma? Hell yes. Absolutely. Don't focus on their karma, focus on yours. Make it about you. What am I doing to help this person come out of that karma and move into the karma that I'm blessed enough to have in this life? That's my answer. Hmm. Well, maybe, maybe offline, you and I can have another conversation because I think, especially for the Western born and raised mind, these are some of the hard questions that a person who studies yoga, I would think we would want to hear that hard answer. And we would, maybe not on a podcast, but in a private conversation with a knowledgeable person who can support us and we care for each other. I think it's Amy, okay. Amy, how can having compassion from them not be a higher answer? Oh, I agree with that answer. <laughs> I'm just saying you said it's there enough. Were... It's enough. <laughs> Curious <laughs> minds want to know our <laughs> But I do agree. It is enough. That is the action we can take to be of service right here, right now. And ultimately what I hear you saying is that's what matters. All my life, Amy, and I know we're coming to the end of this, I wanted a guru. So, of course, I never got a guru. <laughs> you know, it's like I got teachers. I got all kinds of teachers. I got amazing teachers. Man, have I had amazing teachers. But I had to go do it on my own because I realized that the guru was going to be my crutch. I wasn't going to get there as long as I had a guru. I could just put the whole thing on. You know, I wanted someone heavy enough to carry my load. And that was not happening. I had no choice. I had to keep working on myself. I didn't have anybody to give me a hand. I had to work on myself. I had to come from believing that I can never make money to a place of accepting that money isn't what I really need. I've lived in the same apartment for 27 years. I'm happier now than I've ever been. 
because I never found a guru. And so when I came to this realization, I faced one more heartbreak, my guru showed up. Mm -hmm. Because I know that the work is mine, now I have a guru. And he does not judge me one little bit. Mm -hmm. But he loves me. He loves this ego. Does having that mirror of him loving you along with your ego, does that support you to love yourself more? 100%. Yeah. I think that's what we're looking for, right? Yeah. You see, once we come to the understanding that loving just means acceptance, we're okay. Yeah. As long as we put love on the pedestal, we can never reach it. Love is right here. I mean, reach your own heart. It's the nature of your heart, which is why we hate so much, because we're denying our nature. Well, Arun, I, I feel like this is a wonderful place to stop and rest and breathe and feel. It's such a beautiful sentiment that you've shared with us about your guru arriving after you did the work. So I just want to thank you for being my friend and my colleague and for coming on the podcast and sharing your brilliant, brilliant mind with us. <laughs> Can we take a moment and hear about how we could get in touch with you, your website, and any programs that you have coming up? Yes, I have a program coming up, Ayurvedic Psychology, and I'm doing a free intro to it. It'll be in October. And then after the free intro, you will have the option of signing up. And if you know me, I always charge less than I should. <laughs> That's just one of the current things that I need to carry. There'll be a four-part series and it address exactly what you and I started with. It will address Ayurvedic psychiatry, mm -hmm. medicine, Ayurvedic psychology, listening, Ayurvedic psychotherapy, getting involved, mm -hmm. and Ayurvedic psychosomatics. So those are the four parts that we will go into. So that's what's coming up. I'm extremely excited about that. And the other thing I'm excited about is Anjali, your dear friend Anjali, <laughs> my daughter who adores you, and I are going to, to our second India retreat together. It's coming up in 2024. It's on her website, on my website. It's got its own website. It's called rasaindiaretreat.com. Hmm. Let me pull that up for a minute. Look there it is. Tell me about this retreat because I saw your pictures on social media last year and it was magical. Yes. So last year, we of course start with Ayurveda. So I've been leading retreats in 2010. So every time I do this, I take everybody to an Ayurvedic spa in the South of India first and get them acclimatized and get them into the very spirit of yoga and Ayurveda. And then we go on a journey. Then we go on an adventure. So last year we went on an adventure. We stayed in the South and we went to four different places and got a little taste of these four different places. This year, we're going to travel up North to the desert. We're going to travel to Rajasthan. Rajasthan comes from Registan, which means the desert state, but it also comes from Raja, the royal state. So we're going to go to the royal state and we're going to go to the royal palaces. We're going to go to the royal forts. We're going to ride elephants. We're going to ride camels in the sand. We're going to see man-made lakes. We're going to the site of the original and only real Brahma temple. And then we're going to end by going looking on safari. We're going to go looking for tigers. My gosh. Oh, and I've heard in the past you found them. <laughs> oh, God, yes. <laughs> this is the place where I almost always find tigers. So it's the best place to go find a tiger with me. <laughs> Goodness, Arun, that, that is quite a trip you have planned there. And to be with someone so knowledgeable who speaks the language, who knows the culture. I just think if somebody's going to go to India, this is the trip they need to go on. How many spaces do you have? Well, we just started promoting it, so we don't even want to talk about that. But come one, come all, please. We'll let you know when we're sold out like we did last year. We got sold out and we said, hey, we're just not taking any more people. And we did that. So we'll do the same again this time. We'll say, OK, we're sold out when we get there, but we don't know what that number is. And yes, it's good to go with me and it's good to go with someone who's from there, who's got the knowledge. But don't discount the power that Anjali brings to this retreat. <laughs> that girl, oh my God, she knows 
how to make this a memorable experience for each and every person on that retreat. The compassion, the heart, that understanding, that maturity that that girl has, I can't take any responsibility for that. <laughs> That's all her. <laughs> no, she is so wise and so compassionate and has so much clarity. She's a goddess. Oh, all right. Well, we close today and I just want to thank you for coming on short notice. I just asked you two days ago and you were so kind to spend the morning with me. So thank you so much, Arun. Mm, thank you, Amy. Thank you for thinking of me and see you soon. I want to thank Arun for being so generous with his knowledge, his wisdom, his time, his life force. He's one of those people that truly does live his yoga. He is of service. And everything we talked about today, I can check the box. I've known Arun for a long time and I can say, yes, he actually lives that way. Yes, he does do that. Yes, he is following the principles. And I just really admire that about him. I'd like to finish up today just giving you a little tidbit from one of my favorite podcasts called The Hidden Brain. There's a recent episode on July 10th of 2023 called The Paradox of Pleasure. And the host of Hidden Brain interviews a psychiatrist named Anna Lemke, L-E-M-B-K-E. And the thing that I found so fascinating about her and her work is that she says that for every pleasure we take in, we actually have to pay the price for that physiologically. And that as soon as we get that thing we want for pleasure, whether that's a donut or shopping, or whatever it is that you like to do to get your dopamine fix, already physiologically, your body understands that something is out of balance. Your body wants to be in homeostasis. And therefore, when you give it pleasure and the dopamine starts to rush, basically that reward pathway is stimulated. And there's going to be a tilt in equal amount towards the pain because your body wants to bring it back to homeostasis. So if you have all this pleasure, your body physiologically is going to take you the other direction in equal amounts and have these kind of neurochemical adaptions to help you go down and then come back to that balance or homeostasis. You can't go from extreme pleasure to just a nice balanced seesaw. You actually have to go down an equal amount physiologically and then come back to balance. And what's really fascinating to me is that when this happens enough times, while you're experiencing the pleasure, the neurochemical adaptions are already kicking in and you start experiencing pain at the same time as that pleasure. Oof, that's a rough fact from neuroscience. So you're now experiencing the pleasure and the pain at the same time, and there's going to be kind of a, a boomerang. As soon as you come back to homeostasis, your body's going to be looking for that next reward. So it's going to put you in a cycle. And that was fascinating to me to understand that as Arun talked about, these ideas of raga, which is attachment and wanting pleasure and desiring things, and dvesha, which is aversion and hatred and pain, and I don't like that. The way he described that those two get into this cycle is exactly what neuroscience is now telling us. And so I don't think the answer is that we can never experience pleasure, but I think we can take from that, that the goal doesn't have to be, I feel good. I feel great. I need more pleasure. I need to put psychological pillows around me to keep myself safe. It can be that I experience pleasure and that feels good, but it's not the end game because I know there's going to be some aversion that's going to tag onto that. And I'm going to go right back down. What comes up must come down. And then similarly, when I'm experiencing the not so good feelings, the painful feelings, your body also wants to bring you back to homeostasis. It doesn't want to leave you down there. So there's some hope there like, okay, this is going to feel bad for a little bit, but I will come back to mental, emotional, and spiritual and physiological homeostasis. So I thought that was 
interesting. It helps me start to think about chapter four of the Yoga Sutra and this idea of detachment and just craving a more sattvic life, a more neutral life where we're not chasing all the pleasure and wanting things to be perfect and grasping and trying to accumulate so much wealth that we have it for five generations, that kind of thing. We just know that that's actually going to lead to an equal amount of suffering. And instead, this lifestyle that Arun is talking about, where you are here to be of service, and of course you want enough to sustain yourself. That is human nature. We are biologically programmed to need a certain amount of safety and security and food and shelter. And once we have that, and maybe even before we have that, we can really set our mindsets towards compassion and kindness and being of service. So I think that was a great message that Arun brought to us today. And I look forward to talking with you all next week. Have a great week. Thanks for listening. A special thank you to our team here at Optimal State. We are truly a global family. George Mantuan, one of our executive producers. Adam Satchel, senior media producer and sound engineer from the Philippines. Krishna Panchal, a producer from Canada. Modupe Abdullahi, who does the show notes and is an editor for us from Nigeria. And Peter Morley, who wrote and produced the music for this show, who lives in Australia. Find more about Peter's work at www.zenmusic.biz. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time.